oh my. So I need to put like a sign that says recording in process when I do this because I've been almost done with it twice and someone's come in, which I don't mind, but you know, I need to find the pause button quicker or something. So you guys are going to benefit from this and then I'm not going to go into any rants because there's so much to this. All right. So we already had a Missouri compromise homework. So why am I doing this? I'm doing this because... You guys are doing so much better with your map work, which I appreciate. Um, but then the questions you guys turned in um, were wrong or reflected no thought. And I said, you know, we, we can't move on like this because you need to understand the bigger issues concerning with the Missouri Compromise before we get to the Civil War in the next unit. It's really important. So I'm not only going to go over the questions you guys got wrong or didn't even really dive into. I'm going to give you some of these conspiracy theories, which aren't really necessarily conspiracies. There's a lot of evidence behind them. But to get you thinking more, because you need to think about this stuff before we get to the Civil War. So no one had, like not one person, had the question right about how many free enslaved states were there prior to the Missouri Compromise. I think it's partially because you need to read the question, the big word there, prior. That means before. So you shouldn't have counted Missouri. And you shouldn't have counted Massachusetts. And for those of you that made the numbers equal 50, look at this map. There's not 50 states yet, right? So what's going on here? You also should have had an even number because we kept talking about, ooh, it was even, free and slave, and now what was going to happen, right? So it's 11 and 11, and that's why it's significant. There was an equal amount. So if it becomes an uneven amount, that's going to change a lot of things, not just what's slave or what's free, but the balance of power. Who has more power now? the free northern states or the southern slave states. That's a big deal, okay? The question about tension growing in Western settlement, some were more juicier than others, but a lot of people had very guarded, safe, non-critical responses. What you wanna see is that the northern states were focused on making sure that future settlements of the West would prohibit slavery. They did not want slavery to expand. And I know there's a typo here, but this signaled a threat to the institution that Southern states had grown to depend on. What was that institution? It was slavery. Okay. So if slavery was permitted in this Western territory, it would further embed slavery as part of our nation. We wouldn't be a country of half free and half slave. We'd basically be a slave nation. And is that what we wanted? Other things you should notice, look at that line. Look at that red line. That's the 3630 line. That's the line of latitude. Okay. If Southern states expanded slavery, they had less territory to do so with the Missouri Compromise. The Northern state had a lot more, which is why you also can get the idea that this is just a temporary thing, right? We mentioned that they wanted to um, extend the line to the Pacific, not just to the Rockies there. Okay, the big takeaway, go write this down somewhere if you need to, is that the compromise worked in the short term. It was a temporary fix, but the complexities of slavery and manifest destiny would soon surface again. This is not going away. This Missouri compromise was not getting to the heart of any issue. It was just to like, let's put a bandaid on it and move on and we'll let someone else deal with it who comes in Congress after us. So, there's other people that didn't want this temporary fix. Benjamin Talmadge is an example. We've mentioned him before. Uh, Talmadge uh, was not going to run for re-election. In his personal life, actually, he just buried his son in Poughkeepsie, New York. And this congressman from Connecticut gives this speech. And it's often considered to be the slave power thesis, or it focuses on that. The slave power thesis is the idea that the North felt the South was dominating their government. And it shows this sectional divide. Decades before the Civil War, you show this North first South tension. And Talmadge suggested that another slave state would shift power to the slave states. Okay? Um, and the Missouri crisis is just the beginning of escalating this. Um, there was a rise of the belief that there was a slave power conspiracy operating behind the scenes for the benefit of a tiny minority. That minority was the plantation class because most of the white Southerners were not plantation owners, right? This was just the, the top part of that, um, but they were benefiting from this institution. And he says, you know, the Missouri Compromise is just yet another compromise. 
let's look at other compromises in our constitution, which has thus far always favored the South. So let's look at the three fifths clause. That's an article one, section two of the constitution. It agreed with black inferiority, right? It wanted a fair ration for South based on non-citizens. There's real consequences. The consequences are it favors the South because it gives them more votes. It gives them more representation in the House. Let's look at Article 1, Section 3, that comes to two senators per state. Okay, That was for the minority power, which would be small states. Now, in the beginning, that seemed to be pro-Northern. Think of the small states of New Hampshire or Rhode Island. But over time, this actually favored the South even more. Uh, because by the 1850s, northern states' population grew. You get all these immigrants coming to the north, like in Pennsylvania, all those Irish immigrants, um, all things like that. All right, now let's look at Article 1, Section 9, which I don't even have up here. But the slave trade in the Constitution was limited to 20 years in 1808. But more slaves were imported in those 20 years than in any other earlier 20-year period right northerners saw it as importing more votes and this was really hurting the north in the political divide it, it, it made the three-fifths compromise that much more against them article four section two is the fugitive slave clause which we'll get to in the next unit okay so massachusetts for example they abolished slavery in 1786 it was a safe haven for escaped slaves. But, oh, now we have to return people that we sheltered? This really upset Quakers and other people. So basically you have this package of four things, and the North was choking on it. We can give you um, all sorts of other evidence. Um, the House. Until 1820, 79% of the speakers of the House were Southerners. The Ways and Means Committee was controlled by the South by 92%. Um, the the presidents from the South, look at all those presidents from Virginia, Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, right? So the Federalists were like, aha, something is going on here. There is a conspiracy operating here. And it suggests a degree of sectional irritation way before the Missouri Compromise. What else is going on? Okay, realize that voting rates were high. In 1824, you get like 84 to 90% voter turnout. And why is that? Because issues seem to matter, okay? Um, things are turning badly with this panic of 1819. You have an economic depression. It leads to growing tensions. Even Jefferson, you know, he wasn't president anymore, but he was broke and in debt at this point. Okay, what are the causes of this? Well, rampant land speculation from moving out west, people trying to buy up land. The Napoleonic Wars are ending. When I, when I first read this years ago, I was like, well, how does the Napoleonic Wars ending cause an economic depression in America? Well, it's because the U.S. was a supplier of cotton and food to Napoleon's troops. And so this led to a decreased demand in cotton. Cotton prices fell, land prices fell, and people were calling in all these loans. So anyway, Talmadge um, introduces two amendments, and that's to prohibit slavery in new states. And that any new child that is born a slave will be freed at age 25. And the effect is to gradually end slavery in Missouri and everywhere else. And over time, slavery would become extinct. He purposely omits the South in these amendments. Slavery already exists in the South, doesn't want to mess with it, but doesn't want to expand it. Lincoln later says the same thing. Okay, the fact that... Slavery is now crossing the Mississippi into this area, right? This area where we're trying to promote democracy is significant to him. This is why I keep asking you guys to put in the Mississippi River. You need to see the symbolic line here, that it's more than just a political or geographical boundary, okay? There's no slavery here. That's a big symbolic move once you bring slavery here. Um, he doesn't like the reaction from the Southerners. Um, Southerners make threats against Talmadge. Um, in 1819, he already is predicting the Civil War and is basically like, bring it on. Um, he references a duel in his speech. Um, there's a big dueling culture in the South. Um, I, if you ask me in class, I can spend a lot more time on that. Um, so we have this diffusion theory, okay? You know diffusion from science class, I hope, right? 
this is diffused from this, it's spread out over more space. So it's the idea that if you allow slavery to spread, this will make emancipation 